Hello, my name is Jake Kaufman, and you're listening to episode 25 of Way Outside. I hope all of you guys are having a great day. Saying that a lot has happened in the basketball world in the past three weeks would be very much underselling it. Stuff has just been absolutely crazy. The Milwaukee Bucks came back from a 2-0 finals deficit to win four straight games and clinch the city's first championship in 50 years. Led by Giannis Antetokounmpo's all-time great finals performance, Chris Middleton's clutch shot making, and Drew Holiday's swarming defense. The U.S. men's and women's national teams are both starting to heat up and look again like the clear favorites after some scary warning signs by both. The start of NBA free agency was only two days ago, but so many massive trades and signings have happened that will change the outcome of not just this season, but potentially many more to come. I'm going to be going over a lot of stuff today, so let's just jump right in. First, let's talk about the 2021 NBA Finals. What a series it was, man. In my opinion, this was the best finals to watch since 2016, Cavs Warriors, in so many ways. The teams were overall very well matched. Almost all of the games were competitive throughout, coming, especially with game four and five coming down to the last possession, literally. almost uh, The winner of the series was almost always in question, which is something you want, which we haven't seen a lot in, in many recent years. We saw stars shine on the brightest stage, and we saw, finally saw Giannis Antetokounmpo cement his, like, his case as the best player on the planet. The storylines were great, the games were intense, and you could just feel the passion throughout the players, coaches, and even fans. I am just so glad I got to see a finals like this. It was honestly great. I am first going to go into the Phoenix Suns, into what they did well early in the series and what also led to their downfall. And I first off wanna say that, um, and this is just in general, if there was an NBA coach currently that I would wanna play for the most, it would be Monty Williams. I don't know. I'm not saying he's the best coach, but the dude cares. He's passionate. He's smart. He really, if you've seen like mic'd up, he's really impactful in how he interacts with his players. It's honestly just, he talks to them like men. He really tries to establish a relationship with them. You've seen that, especially when him with Chris Paul, Monty Williams is, if I had a coach, I would want to, he's just all of those things. He's just, it just also just seems like a great guy. However, the Suns, lost this series in some major ways. Um, the, uh, cr- crazily, the Suns outshot the Bucks from both from field goal percentage, three-point pro- three percentage, and free throw percentage throughout in the finals, but still lost. That doesn't normally happen. If you get outshot in all three aspects of the field, you're usually going to lose a series. It's just how it is. Um, yeah, um, you're normally going to lose. That's basically what it is. Um, especially if you go up 2-0. But the thing that happened was is that while the Bucks didn't shoot well from three, mostly for the entire playoffs, but especially at times not in the series, the thing that helped them manage that and also just even go above the Suns was rebounding. They killed the Suns on the boards in this series. They out-rebounded them for the series by over 45. And you're not going to be – and that's a lot because even if you're not making – if you're getting – that many extra possessions and are stealing about that many extra possessions, it is honestly going to really help you. And in terms of offensive rebounds, the Bucks had 37 more than the Suns. Those are extra opportunities that give you chances to come back and score. And the Bucks really feasted off of them throughout the series. It was very obvious that you could tell that the Bucks were just the second chance points were insane in this series. And just the Bucks having all the size with Giannis Brooke Lopez, Bobby Portis, and also all of their players rebound way better, way taller than they are. Drew Holiday has got had games with almost 10 rebounds. PJ Tucker, we know, is always going to be willing to go in and snatch it out. Um, Chris Middleton's very an underrated player in terms of his all-around game, but that's where the Bucks killed it. And I think the main reason we forget about this is just because of the fact that, you know, he plays well. Giannis initially wasn't supposed to play in this series. Like, I don't know if anyone else personally watched. I saw the the hyperextended knee, and um, I thought he was going to be out for the rest of the season. And I was worried about the thing. that I've seen ACL tears. I've seen those kind of things. That did not look good, and a lot of people were worried about it. He was – it did not look like a good injury, and it was really upsetting considering, you know, a lot of – all of the injuries that have happened in the playoffs. And this, this is a topic I'm going to get to later. But um, the fact that he came back, if Giannis had came back and let's say they lose in five and he was just averaging 25, 
10 and two, we would have been applauding him like crazy because of the fact that we thought he wasn't going to play. The fact that what Giannis did averaging 35, 13 and five with almost with a steal and a half and two blocks per game on 62% shooting is incredible. He was all time great. He could not be stopped in the paint. Like it ever was. Yes. He didn't do yes. Again, he's not making the threes, but what he did do is he was, he limited how many he took. He only took 15 in the six games. It's a little over two per game. Yes, he did struggle from the free throw line for the series, but in the game six close out, he was 17 for 19, which is good for anybody from the free throw line. And his defense was just absolutely incredible. He is, and I think a lot of people for whatever reason argue that, you know, his 2020 defensive play of the year shouldn't have been warranted, but it really has. Giannis is a unique defender in terms of the fact that he might not get the most steals and block totals, but that doesn't, I feel like we, we overrate that as defenders, but Giannis is basically a free safety who you, they play in free safety a lot in the drop coverage where who can guard literally one through five in that game, six, especially that second half him getting to all those blocks. Those are not easy plays. First of all, that she had a chase down block in game one. That was incredible. He has the, of course, the block in game four on Deandre Aiden, which was an all time great. He again blocked bridges on the backboard like that. He was swatting everything. So he had five blocks, I believe, in game six. And he is just, and no one could do anything with him. He he uses his athletic gifts to his advantage entirely on the defensive end. And I think why you can make a case, I don't know if I would say oh, for him as the best defender or maybe just a better defender, Rudy Gobert is, even though Rudy Gobert is three defensive player of the years, as you saw in the Clipper series, there's a there are defensive schemes that can expose Rudy Gobert. There is not a defensive scheme, and there's not an offense. Okay, I'm going to make sure I'm here. There's not a scheme that an offensive scheme that another team can run that can expose Giannis as a defender. That's just there's not one because Giannis can do it. Are there things he's better at? Yes, but there's no defensive or offensive set you can run that will make Giannis a liability on the defensive end. And I think that's that's an insane. He is. Just, I said all the numbers already, but. Yeah. Also, we have to talk about how great Chris Middleton was. Chris Middleton averaged 24 points for six rebounds and five assists for the series. You know, um, he's and he is one of the most frustrating players to watch because on his good days, he looks like a not a, a near superstar. But and then he'll have games where he is rough, to say the least. But I think the thing that we I we all have to do is giving Chris Middleton credit for is Chris Middleton is incredibly well-rounded. Um, he's not gonna get talked about because he doesn't he's not flashy at all even his stuff jumpers and step back it's not the flashiest whatsoever but the dude gets it done gets it done in big moments and he got it done he shot 45 percent from the field and 36 percent from three i told you all the numbers before he had 40 in game four he almost all of the clutch shots late in those games were done by middleton who can in the last seconds of the game there's not there might not be even 10 there's not 10 other more players in the league with like last two minutes that I'd rather have than Chris Middleton. Is he the 10th best player in the league? No, but I'm saying just that he he's consistently clutch almost always. Now we need to talk about Drew Holiday and I am a big fan of Drew Holiday, but I had also, I had at times I was very furious with him in this series. I mean, for the series, he did average 17 points, six rebounds and nine assists all as long with two and a half steals and a block, but he shot 36% from the field and 31% from three. However, and this is hard to, I never thought I could have a player say this. He was so good on the defensive and playmaking end that I can almost excuse his percentages. What Drew Holiday did on the defensive end in this adjustment for when, but when they put Booker and Paul, the stat, I don't have it pulled up on me, but there was the amount of the number of percentages between with Chris Paul and Devin Booker shooting with anyone else on the Bucks guarding him versus Drew Holiday is absurd. The dude swarms you. He gets up into you. He causes problems on almost anyone. He is relentless. He has a very low foul rate, despite how tenacious he is as a defender. It's just everything about how he is as a defender is incredible. He's and he did. He was so impactful, and as well as the assists, he was their primary ball handler. He made plays at the right times. He just has such a good basketball IQ in terms of everything else besides when I should, she should shoot. And, and he really displayed it. 
defense wins championships, and that is was dis- displayed especially in um game five. If you guys, as you know, the the Bucks are up one. Devin Booker gets the ball to try to take the lead, and this is something you will not see often in a in late game play. A player getting literally ripped. Oh wait, Booker gets stopped for a second. Holiday snatches the ball with two hands out and picks it up, and then throws an incredible lob to Giannis for the thing. But that was that was his that play was the essential of what Drew Holiday was in that series. He, especially after, in game five, he did have 27 and 12. His shooting was not good. I'm not going to deny that, but he was so impactful. It was honestly incredible to see. But yeah, those three guys, obviously, there's so many other players I'm going to give credit to. Pat Connaughton had some amazing minutes off the bench in terms of he was hitting, he hit clutch threes. He hit one in game four that gave him the lead late. He had a lot of, he was off, he had 10 offensive rebounds in the series as a 6'5 guard. Uh, Bobby Portis, who, uh, who um, as a Bulls fan, I loved and who Milwaukee loves. That the if, if you watch the games, the chance that Bobby Portis gets in Milwaukee is incredible just because of how hard he plays. That team was just a team you want to root for, man. I just did it like that. And um, now I'm going to get into something. The injuries thing. First of all, yes. Do, inj- do injuries suck? And do we know for sh- are we Can we say for sure that if there's no injuries? The Bucks would and Suns would make the finals. No, we can't because we don't know that. But however, I am tired of that always being the excuse for a team making the finals when they still teams still have to go out there and execute. And we've seen teams that have players that are not injured versus teams that are, and they'll still lose. For example, the Clippers didn't have Kawhi for the last two games of the Utah series and still beat them. So as much as we're gonna, we can say that, you know, I'm tired of fluke, fluke all this, the fluke bullshit, all of that. No. The two teams are on their way to be here. And I feel like, especially in recent years, people will literally just find a way. Like there's players that people will just find a way to diminish their accomplishments. Whether it's on YouTube comments, it's spam bots on Twitter or Instagram. It's just like the dumbest things. And the truth is, is that if you really try hard enough and go to enough loopholes, you can make any achievement sound unimpressive. Here, I'll try. Michael Jordan won six championships, but he won zero without a Hall of Fame forward and without a head coach. He lo- he's left for two years. Wow, what a, what what a loser to leave for two years, and he didn't win champion. He didn't win a championship until he, until for his first seven years, so he's not good. Like you can make anything sound unimpressive. Like the Lake would say, like Steph Curry's twenty sixteen MVP season. Dude has the greatest, um, who had the greatest shoot, uh, one of the, maybe the greatest offensive scoring season ever. Washed Curry, gets his help from his teammates, soft, that, lost in the final. It's like, you can make it, if you try hard enough, you can make anything sound unimpressive, but that doesn't take away. The, but this was not a fluke season. The team, a Bucks team that deserved and earned their way to win, won. And I think we all just need to stop doing this fluke thing when we're now analyzing championships because it's ridiculous. Um, the last thing I'm going to say about this is I did, I line it, but to me now, the best play in the world case is solved and it's Giannis. And I know a lot of people are going to push back on it and I can take, and I can understand their thinking. A lot of people are going to go with Kevin Durant. I'm who he, they barely beat in the second round. And as much as I like, appreciate Kevin Durant's greatness and his game is unquestionably more uh, fun to watch and looks better. I can't with because of what thing is I can't say he's an overall greater player. Kevin Durant has never won a title without a super team. He has been to the finals without a super team, but it was a team that had three stars. Kevin Durant has never won it. Um, he is a great player who is arguably the most skilled score ever, but in some ways, Kevin Durant is lesser than the sum of his parts. Giannis is besides score besides scoring and shooting. Giannis is better at everything else than Kevin Durant. He's a better defender. He's a better passer. He is more athletic at this point. He has a higher motor. He is thought of as a big, better leader. All of those things. He um, he plays every possession like it's his last. And I think those things such as hustle and stuff matter. Great thing. They're not all quantifiable stats, no, but Giannis does things that lead to winning. 
And the fact that he does that and he still has those flaws is just incredible. Talk about how much better he can become. But to me, and also people can say LeBron, I understand that last time a lot of people called out LeBron in 2019, they want him back. But I just don't see the thing about LeBron. The thing about that, first of all, is that he's going to be playing, which I'm going to get into a little bit later. It's going to be a long, probably, um, with Anthony Davis and Russell Westbrook next year. And his numbers are probably not going to look the same. And also, he's going to be 37. Eventually, Giannis is 26. He has done all the things. Like I said, I just think Giannis has to be the number one player. But no, that was a mouthful. So let's talk about free agency, a much lighter and not an intriguing topic. I'm obviously kidding. Um, being, I've been on vacation <laughs> the last few days since uh, Saturday. And um, <laughs> seeing it's been crazy because I have not been able to put my phone down with everything going on. And um, there's been so much has happened. Obviously, I alluded to it too. Russell Westbrook got traded to the Lakers for Kuzma and Harold, but um, and it's a very weird move for me. I'm gonna analyze some of these moves. If they're not big, irrelevant enough to me, you won't. But yeah, Russell Westbrook is a very great player. He is he is so athletic. He has the high, arguably the highest motor ever, and he is a flash of transition. With the in strictly regards to the, those three. I don't know how it's going to fully work. I know that there was a report LeBron and Russ and AD met down. It's just their games don't fully really mesh with each other. All three of them are below are at best average shooters at their position. Russell Westbrook's a very bad three-point shooter. Anthony Davis is a very good mid-range shooter, but three-pointers is not his thing. And LeBron's obviously good at times, bad at times, overall streaky. And also just like as much as, you know, LeBron has said he wants to not have the ball in his hands, even with Russell Westbrook, the ball is safer in LeBron's hands because Russell Westbrook gets a lot of assists, but he also gets a lot of turnovers, which you can, which we've seen can derail championship hopes. And we've tried seen Russell Westbrook, I guess, semi attempt to play off the ball and it doesn't do anything. He really just stands there. Does it? I think that there, the time is that the talent might work out, especially with all of the other pieces they've signed, but those three is a whole thing. So let's talk about now some of the, of the extensions that got, sign a lot of a lot um a lot of players either both young and old got extensions to keep them in their place for a while both trey young and steph curry got four years want 215 million dollar extensions which i they're both deserving of um trey had a great playoff run leading the team to the eastern conference finals and is only 22 and steph obviously led the league in scoring had a lot of had a real case for mvp all that's true i'm Totally on fine with all that money for them. On the other hand, Jimmy Butler got a huge bag as well. He got four years, 184 million. And if you know me well, Jimmy Butler is my favorite basketball player of all time. He is great. He's tough. He is better than his statue. Even with that, I can't, I don't know how to fully justify paying him this much money. He will be making over $50 million when he is 36. And he's not a great shooter. As much as I love Jimmy, I he got lucky with this payment. I, I hope he'll prove me wrong because he's proved a lot of people wrong before. But I, it's just a lot of money. Shea Gilgis Alexander got a five years, $172 million extension. And a lot of the people I was talking to saying is, you know, are we sure he's earned it? To me, he has. Well, has he, has he led a playoff team yet? No. First of all, let's remember, he's three years in. His first year, he was a very solid rookie on the Clippers who showed so many flashes. His second year, he was the second best player on the team after Chris Paul on a team that almost – that took the Rockets to game seven. And this year, before he got hurt, he was – he had incredible averages, like 24, 4, 5, and 5 on a great efficiency and showing a really good playmaking. He's athletic. He's 6'5". He is skinny, but he is athletic and he has a big wingspan and he shows a lot of promise defensively. So I just think, you know, he's, is he made the accolades to necessarily hundred percent justify yet? No, but um, I really think he, there's a very good case to make that he deserves it. Um, John Collins recent, this was a really recently broke up that he's going to resign with the Hawks for five years, 125 million. I think it's a little bit too much per year, but John Collins is so key to what the Hawks did last year and in the future. And he's only 23 and he works so well with Trey Young that I am totally fine with this. They needed to get him back for the future of the team. Chris Paul opted after rumors of the Knicks, the Lakers, et cetera, 
decide to re-sign with the Suns for four years and up to 120 million. I mean, it seems like a lot for a guy who's going to be 40, but again, Chris Paul was so key to this team. He is such a key mentor to Devin Booker and everything. And he hasn't really shown any signs of flowing down at 36. So while it is a lot of money, I would give it to him. He got you to your first finals in 29 years or 27 years, one of the two. Jared Allen got a bag from Cleveland for five years, which I'm like fine with. Kyle Lowry's ended his, um, I believe, nine-year stint in Toronto with a uh, signing trade to the Heat and got three years, 90 million. I'm, I, I, you guys know, I'm a Bulls fan. I'm a Heat fan because of Jimmy. Second, they're my second. I don't know how to feel because, like, you got to trade a guy who's just as old as Goran Dragic, who, while Kyle Lowry is, yes, better, he's going to be making 30 million a year when he is 38. That's a lot of money. <laughs> Kyle Lowry is very good. And I think his game has aged incredibly well, but I'm not fully sure about how I feel about this. Duncan Robinson also got a re- bag from the Heat to re-sign for five years, 90 million. I honestly think that's a, a perfect value for him, maybe even a little bit better, a good deal. He's just such a good shooter who also is, while he's not great at other things, he works, you can see legitimately works hard to get better at other things. And his defense has gotten so much better in the past year that he's not a good defender, but he shows so much growth that you can expect him to develop another thing. Norman Powell got the same contract from the Blazers, which I think is a good deal for them. I mean, it's great. I mean, I don't know how, you know, it's going to be remains to be seen if the Blazers end up trading low or something, but it's a good deal for them. Powell was very good for them, and that's not a crazy amount of money. Now there's some – my Bulls made some moves. We got uh, Lonzo Ball was in a signing trade from the Pelicans to us for four years, $85 million. It does seem like a lot of money for me as a Bulls fan, I'm not going to lie, but – it gives us something we haven't had. We have a point guard. We have a primary playmaker now. We didn't, the Bulls have not had that in a while. And a guy who also has shown great improvement, a good defender, which we didn't really have. And just a lot of talent. And he's still very young and his time fits up. And it's good because he's, even though a lot of the moves that brought in are people that are older, he's young and he still has a chance to grow and develop a lot more. The Bulls also recently got DeMar DeRozan in a signing trade for three years, $85 million thing. Um, as a Bulls fan, I'm a little confused about why this trade happened. I mean, I get the idea of it. And because Lonzo, Levine, and Vucevic and Williams I mean, are all above average three-point shooters for their position, you can justify letting DeMar, you know, be the mid-range guy. It's still kind of an odd fit for a guy who's not great defense and is out some way similar to Levine. But it gives the Bulls a... a group of developed and established players along with guys who are not too old. Vucevic is only in Vucevic is 30. Demar is 31. They're not like way past their prime or anything. I, I I'm excited as a Bulls fan. We real, real hope that we haven't seen for a while. This one came as kind of a surprise to a lot of people. Evan Fournier got four years, $78 million from the Knicks. And I like Evan Fournier. He's very good, especially in France. That's a lot of money for him, especially, you know, a lot of people thought he was going to stay at the Celtics. He wanted to. The Knicks, obviously, in the history, have not always been the best with giving contracts out, but he was very good, and I think, you know, we can see what Thibodeau does with him. Tim Hardaway re-signed with the Mavs, which I think is key for them. He was their second-best player in that playoff run after Luka. He's a great shooter. He competes on the defensive end. He's pretty similar to his dad in a lot of ways. He's just good. The Jazz also re-signed Mike Conley, which they needed to do. Yeah, I'm not going to care about the kid. Um, the Knicks also re-signed Derrick Rose, which they also needed to do. See, that's not relevant. That's not relevant. Alex Caruso to the Bulls. It's not relevant, but it's Alex Caruso and it's my team, so I'm just going to talk about it. Yay, we got we got the Caruso. Nice. Okay, moving on. Um, I think now a lot of the major, major deals are done, but now we're going to talk about PJ, T- the Heat. P.J. Tucker left the reigning champs of the Bucks to go to the Heat, which I think he'll be a great fit on the defense that that team is going to be able to play is incredible. Um, with him, Lowry, Bam, Oladipo, who's just resigned all of the, their defense is going to be incredible. Of course, Jimmy, it's going to be great. And I think he just fits in. He's a hard nosed guy. Jimmy, you know, is a hard, I think it's a good fit. The Lakers signed a lot of players to help with their shooting. They signed Kendrick Nunn. They got Carmelo. They got Malik Monk. 
they got to white howard back the lakers made a lot of signings and while a lot, a lot of it are stars and look good they are very old and it remains to be seen a lot of people are comparing it to the 0304 lakers who signed carmelo and stuff and then i'm gonna say i don't know what's gonna happen with the lakers it's it could go very well and they could maybe go like 70 no, no. but like the lakers have a lot of potential but they also are very old in pl- their players have been injury prone in recent years um I don't want to think. I know the Lakers have made a lot of moves, and I do think, in theory, a lot of them make sense. But, you know, it remains to be seen about how they did it. But I think the the real winners from free agency so far have to be the Lakers, the Bulls, I would say the Heat. Um, I would say the Pistons strictly because they got the draft Cade Cunningham, you know, which is a bright in itself. Um Let's see who else who I think is a major winner. Um, I don't know, but I can tell you some losers. The Pelicans are a loser because while they got decent value for Lonzo, Zion really likes playing with him, and they need to find they need to find and press Zion. Zion is playing in a small market, wants to be in a larger one. He's had three head coaches in three years. It's just. He, and he's with his talent, he's going to want to compete and make the playoffs. And he feels like he should be on a team to do that. So if they're not, that's so just a lot of pressure on the Pelicans. Um, it's also confusing for the Wizards because, again, while Russell S. Bradley Beal insists he want to be there, I, I don't know why. It doesn't make any damn sense, Bradley. Just leave. But, yeah, he still wants to be there. There's a lot of teams that have questions to answer. And there's definitely – I'm going to have to make another episode to go in – all of this on free agency, but it's just honestly been going on for a while guys. And so, yeah, I think I'm going to call it here. Um, thank you all for listening and checking in the way outside. Um, hope you guys have been enjoying this re- last few weeks as much as I have, and I'll see you guys next time.